I can totally tell you how I met him. I was in a car. <laughs> it was just weird. It was 1981, because I was doing an internship. I, I finished university in, in 1980. I was in KZN in Maritzburg. And so he and, and someone called Michael Cassidy, who headed up something called Africa Enterprise, which was based in, in, in Maritzburg. And he, he, and he and the Archbishop, I, I suppose, had been having talks of some kind. And we all had to get to Durban. Well, they had to get to Durban because they were the main speakers. I had to get to Durban because I was a helper. <laughs> so I got a lift in a car with Michael Cassidy and Archbishop Tutu. And now I'm all of 21. <laughs> and I'm just sitting in the back, minding my own business. <laughs> and they are talking about their, their last visits to the Prime Minister and what they said to him and so on. I'm like agog and I'm just listening. I'm just little me. And then, then he goes, I mean, halfway through, it's a long drive, it's about 45 minutes. So halfway through, he turns around and he says, no, he says, so he goes, tell me about yourself. <laughs> so of course, then I try and, and sort of, oh, it's so funny, right? Trying to talk about all my activist credentials. <laughs> what I'm involved with, what I do. I was a founding member of SUCA, this Student United for Christian Activism thing. And then he just looks at me in the car and he says, No, he goes, not what you do, who you are. Tell me about your family and this, you know. Like a hundred things he's said to me over the years, said to me over the years, I've never forgotten that. How do you forget that? You know, it's not about what you do, it's about who you are. And that was him, and that's why everybody thought they were his best friend. Because when he was talking to you, he focused on you, and he remembered you. So I was born and bred in Cape Town. I was, in fact, born in Milton, same place where the Archbishop lived many years later, not very far from where they lived. Um, so my parents were not South African. My mother was born in London. My father was... a, a born in Denmark and so they were both immigrants into South Africa so I'm a first generation South African um, and that definitely has something to do with who I am and my values and how we lived growing up in part because uh, neither of them spoke any Afrikaans and Mulleton was pretty Afrikaans kind of place um, and so they really raised us differently to the people around us mm. while I also realized we the, the, the beauty of diversity, because within my family I had cousins whose names were very different to, they weren't in English. <laughs> so we had to learn that the Danish alphabet had three extra letters and how to pronounce our Danish cousins and aunties and uncles' names and so on. So we really got a good grounding in, in the reality of, of diversity, if you like, and multiculturalism, uh, except not within the African context, in the, in the European context. And so my parents did not want to send us to the dual medium Afrikaans English school because we might, we might be, be re, you know, socialized with Afrikaans people. <laughs> so we went off to the Catholic convent to Holy Cross. And it's on the border of, of rugby and Brooklyn. Um, so just, just for two years. And life being life, we would have just gone to Maitland um, Holy Cross Convent High School. And that would have been very different, except that we emigrated back to Denmark because of the politics of South Africa when I was seven, um, at the sort of press, under pressure from my dad's family, they kind of pressurized. And then for various reasons we came back about six months later, um, because neither parent really could, could, could cope with all of what it meant to live back in Europe in the, in the cold winters and other things. They'd been gone a long time. Both of them also grew up in the Second World War. Uh, both of them had uh, their fathers died when they were teenagers or young adults, so they grew up um, financially struggling with single mothers. Mm -hmm. So we lived actually pretty simply mm -hmm. and took nothing for granted and heard lots of stories of, uh, you know, what they were or were not allowed or how difficult life was during, during the war. So, so I think we just grew up with a bit of a different background. Mm -hmm. And they also always taught us what's happening in South Africa is absolutely wrong and there's and there's not anything you can do about it. If you try and do something about it, you will get into trouble, which was in fact true to a, to a degree, but not maybe the degree that they thought so. And they were very shy and not, not, I'm not, not like my parents. <laughs> <laughs> Could you talk a little bit more about those college years? Yeah, absolutely. Because for me, they were transformative. And it was because of, of, 
of my own personal transformation as a college student that I realized I, I wanted to be involved in transformation of, of other young adults and college students and, mm -hmm. and that's really what propelled me towards the, the, whole, the whole idea of calling also. So it was very important. So I mean I was just I was just lucky. I mean I went to a camp at the end of high school where there were a bunch of university students who were part of a, a Christian group called SCA. Mm -hmm. I landed up in a Bible study with them and I was way younger. I mean they were like th third, fourth and fifth year and I was like a little first year. But Peter Moll, who was one of the early objectors, he was in the Bible study. And so we, you know, so I, I learned that he wasn't going to go to the army because the draft was there. You, know, you had to go either before school, I mean, after school or after university. Um, he's about to publish his memoirs, which I'm reading through. And I mean, just amazing. I mean, he asked us to help quiz him. You know, he, had, he had to go to court, he had to go to trial about why he wasn't prepared to do army service. Mm -hmm. Because at that stage, there, were, there, was, there was no possibility of objection. You either left the country, or you, you could become a medic, or you went to jail, basically. That was it. So, so he knew that he was choosing to go to jail, basically. So he had to be prepared. Um, and so he, we would quiz him on his, his own defense, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, and a lot of that was around how do you read scripture? in a context like this in South Africa. So and his cousin then, Richard Steele, did the same thing a little later. And it was fascinating because Peter was, was a just war theorist. There were different reasons why you might do this. But he was very clear this, this war is unjust. And it is, it is a war. And I'm not prepared to wear a uniform that might require me to go into the townships and shoot someone that I might have actually got to know at a conference. That is, is you know, and the war is unjust. So, and that, that in theological speak allows one to, to uh, take the action of conscience. His cousin was a pacifist, which is totally different. And they both looked to the same Bible, the very same Bible. They were both Baptist. They both did, did, the, did the research, did their homework, did their own you know, searching, self-searching, and so on, and came out at different points. And so at a young age, I just realized, I was 17, I realized, you know, scripture doesn't say like one thing. You can't go, the Bible says, you know, the Bible says maybe four different things about war, at least. So and you can come out with very valid uh, reasonings and different points uh, in any way, and, and none of them are wrong. So that was a big lesson, you know, when you, when you sort of face later with people who says, the Bible says this, you're like, well... Maybe the Bible says some other things. You know, it's a good lesson. And we also we also did a lot of a lot of Bible study related to context, contextual Bible study. Mm -hmm. How do you relate what's in the Bible to the context around you? And let's see, I was at UCT 70, 1977 to nineteen eighty. Mm -hmm. So nineteen seventy nine was a seminal year for for basically the church and Christianity in South Africa because two two things happened with. Within the student movement, we had a conference which brought together students of every race and Afrikaans, white, white Afrikaans, white English speaking, colored students from UWC, black students from Fort Hare, which is a hotbed of activism and so on. And at some point, someone said something like this, what does it mean to love, your, to love God and love your neighbor as yourself if your neighbor is a black South African? For me, it was just like these blinkers came off and I'm like, no, wait, you know this, right? You grew, you've grown up in church, you've heard your entire life, love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, just all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. You know it, right? Nobody ever said, literally, it's the blindness of South Africa. Nobody ever said, what does it mean? I, even the Good Samaritan, nobody said, but who is my neighbor? You know, which is kind of crazy. It just shows how blinded the system, I think, the system played havoc with people's mind in some ways, right? So what does it mean? And I was like, I have to answer this question. So my answer to myself was, it means I have to work for the same privileges I have as a white person for black people in South Africa. Before we get fully into everything, would you be willing to tell us about the picture behind us real quick? Oh, absolutely. Uh, that was actually that was uh, that picture was in. If I look at my scrapbook, I'd tell you which newspaper. But it was it was it was in one of the newspapers. So it was one of the one of the Cape Town journalists, media journalists, who was present at the ordination 
uh, the, the first woman to the priesthood in the Diocese of Cape Town and the first women priests that Archbishop Desmond Tutu ordained as women priests. So it was a very significant moment in the life of the city and in the life of the country. So yeah, so, so yeah, so, so can I tell my Desmond yes, Tutu please. story? Oh, it's classic. I have preached, used this in sermons in every single church I've been because it just never fails. <laughs> it's so good. So, so it's like day two, we're at the showgrounds, you know, and I, I can't remember how many people, but let's just at least 10,000. They might mean the thousands, right? So they make this announcement from the stage that the toilets are taking strain now because there's so many people. So could, they please, could people please volunteer to come and, and clean the toilets? And, and of course, me and my friends, my friends and I are going, oof! I don't think so, you know. I mean, we were like 19, you know. So we were like, eh, didn't do it. And the next day, they said that Art, uh, she was then Bishop Silk. Bishop Tutu was one of the first volunteers to come and help clean the toilets. And we all felt very um, ashamed. <laughs> like, oh, we see why we aren't leaders. <laughs> We are not, we are not great leaders like Bishop Tutu, you know, I've never, I can't forget that story, right? So and that's, uh, I hope I have tried to emulate that in my life. I never forget, you know, because clergy especially can be treated so like on a pedestal right. that you get to almost expect it. Mm -hmm. And people say, come to the front of the line. And, you know, unless this is a good reason, there's no reason to. You know, so people know I'm going to say, no, I'll hang out at the back. Unless I've got something to do, then I'll say thank you. But to, to, to try to try to say, no, you know, this is about serving. And he was always like that. He would bring, if, it, if, if somebody, if a dignitary was there, uh, at Bishop's Court, that is, when I was now his chaplain. If a dignitary is there, he would say, go and, fetch, go and fetch the driver. So I would go to fetch the driver. The driver would come and join everyone for lunch. You know, um, that was him. He just he wouldn't get away with sitting somewhere, uh, with having the servant, you know, in a back room or in a car or, in, or somewhere else. He were brought in to be there. And that's, you know, such a strong form, a formative influence in my life.